Hey, welcome to Black Man Speak. I'm your co-host, VJR Stewart. And I'm your co-host, the Tommy D. Duncan III, otherwise known as TD3. Ladies and gentlemen, it is Wednesday, January the 11th, 2023. Jimmy, and if it's Wednesday night. It's Black Man Speak. So let's give a big shout out to Liquid for providing our theme music. Um, and we also want to uh, encourage everyone to go ahead and hit that like button, uh, hit the notification bell, hit the subscribe button, and then spread the word. To, you know, invite a friend to come out to the show. You don't have to do them in that order, but you know, try to get all uh, three or four of them done um, at some point to help us out. Well, Jimmy, we are going to uh, have a twist in tonight's show. Uh, we started off last week with issues that are in the news, and we're going to continue that narrative. We had a, a special guest lined up uh, for this Wednesday, but unfortunately, we weren't able to uh, get that inked in. But uh, uh, we will continue to uh, focus on those things that are important to you, yes. our constituents, and our guests. And uh, we want to thank you for your support throughout 2023, because uh, we are definitely wrapping our game up this year, Jimmy. So without... Um, um exposing the identity of our guests, in fact, two guests. Uh, they both work for Google, and evidently Google has a policy against their programmers and key people appearing on a podcast. So um, they were not able to get clearance to come on our show. So, um, yeah, we're just going to carry on and talk about some things that are happening in the news. Absolutely, Jimmy. And so with this being the beginning of the year, for those of you who are sports fans, obviously there's a lot going on this time of the year. So we're going to start off uh, with a few items uh, in the sports news this week, and then we're going to carry on to some other national news. Uh, Jimmy, I, I think you uh, said that you uh, watched the game this past weekend, but man. I watched half of the time. I couldn't digest the rest. Um, <clears throat> there's a point. You know, you want to cheer for the underdog. You want to, you want to believe that there's a chance that they can crawl back in and make this a competitive effort. Tom, there is no chance TCU is going to crawl back into this game. Yeah, uh, Jimmy, they were truly really outmatched against Georgia. Outmatched, outgunned, and everything else. And for those of you, uh, many of you. Listening in from Texas, know what we're talking about. That is the NCAA college football playoff championship game uh, between the TCU Horn Frogs and the Georgia Bulldogs. And of course, we're talking about the um, returning NCAA college football playoff championship Georgia uh, Bulldogs who were playing against really a Cinderella story uh, in uh, TCU. Nobody had them on their radar and really even being a top 10 team, probably not at the top 25 team this year, Jimmy. And uh, they were able to run it out, uh, do extremely well. Uh, I think lost one game. And I guess it was prophetic, the game that they lost in the conference championship before going to the college football playoff championship. Jimmy, I was actually a bit surprised that they were selected for the Final Four, given that they lost to Kansas State in the well, Tom, Big 12 you, championship you game. Put, you couldn't put the uh, Kansas State in there. No, you no, I wasn't just, expecting Kansas State either. And they certainly didn't want to put a two-loss team of Alabama in there, although I believe Alabama would have – I think it's through the loss of Georgia, because Georgia is just a better team this year. Um, but I still think Alabama would have gave a better game than TCU. Well, Jimmy, I, I would say this. I I can't – having a team that is a one-loss team versus a two-loss team, considering the conferences that they come from, is a bit of a conversation, because I would say that a two-loss team – in the SEC, e, SEC, Southeastern Conference, may be a little bit different than a one-loss team, possibly in the Big 12 this year. True. If you look at the rest of the teams in the Big 12, University of Oklahoma is not the University of Oklahoma that we've seen oh, over the last no. several years. Texas is still trying to figure its way out. And, mm -hmm. and you know, just kind of as a forecast for those of you who do not know, both the University of Oklahoma and the University of Texas are going to be taking their talents to the SEC in just a couple of years, for those of you who did not know, for those of you who uh, you know watch that. college football, yeah, you, you, I think most of you do know that if you watch college football, but OU in Texas will be moving to the SEC. You know what, Tom, that would be a big mistake. One is going to kill the Big 12. But two, I think they're making the same mistake A&M made. Mm -hmm. um, you're getting ready to be 
I mean, right now, Texas and Oklahoma, and even a and when they were in the Southwest Conference, um, were big fish in a decent-sized pond. Mm-hmm. Now you can ready to go to an ocean, and but they, they, they are not, not just fish in their time. They have whales, killer whales, orcas. Um, you're going to get swallowed up in the SEC. You got to be prepared to go deal with that. You got to get past Alabama and Georgia every year. And you still have some teams like Florida, uh, uh, the Mississippi States, Old Miss of the world that are not, you know, that shabby either. Um, Auburn uh, every now and then will rise up. But you, you got to be prepared to do recruiting. And for a team like, let's say, AM, I mean, great, great recruiting class, one of the best in the nation the last couple of years. Well, Jimmy, they, they, in my opinion, had a coaching hire issue that um, unfortunately did them in because that is not to say that A&M could not compete with the SEC. Unfortunately, they had a coach who could recruit, but just like a lot of our old Texas fans said about Mac Brown, you have someone who can, who's a great recruiter, but in terms of building a system that is sustainable over a long period of time and winning championships, that's a different ball game, with the exception of having someone like a Vince Young. Tom, anybody decent, any decent coach should be able to coach. When you get 30 of the top 100 players in the nation, one school, 30, that's a great recruiting class, Tom. You should be able to coach that. That 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 should be enough talent to at least get you something, a bowl appearance, a, a winning record. To be it competitive. did. It did until this year when uh, the great Jimbo Fisher, formerly of Florida State, coached them to a five and seven record. Um, and you know, quite frankly, coming off and this is the interesting thing about it, is that before the season started. Nick Saban, St. Nick, as some people call him, actually was uh, had, had, had what we would call some shade for Jimbo Fisher in terms of him so-called paying uh, recruits to come uh, to Texas A&M University because they had the number one class. And I guess he was upset that he didn't have the number one class. Um, they all but, 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 but guess what? I know that. I know that. But guess what happened with the season? And so when you consider their their record this year when you consider the number of top recruits that they lost what does that really mean if you're not developing those players if they're not really building your system to get to the next level yes uh so true so uh with such a great recruiting class and had such a horrible quarterback it was, it was painful to watch but you'll get exposed in the sec um they may have been able to survive if they're a big 12 team they stayed in the Southwest Conference and then the Big 12. They stayed here, Tom. And who knows? You know, maybe they have a winning record. You know, maybe they're competing with TCU to get out of here for the Big 12 championship with, uh, between TCU, Oklahoma, uh, and in the Texas. Uh, the Big Four would be back uh, intact. So all I'm saying is just I, I know there's money to be made in the SEC. It's very attractive. But and man, that is, is, and that is the reason. Why Be careful OU, jumping in that shark tank. And that um, is the reason why OU and Texas are going to the SEC. That's why SEC well, man, is not like Texas is a poor school, Tom. They have a network. They have the uh, I know that. long on network. They made money. Uh, exactly. exactly. But, but, man, I don't know if Texas is ready. I mean, they're going to be a doormat in the SEC. Then, I mean, really, I mean, they're ready to go compete in that, in that pool with those sharks. Well, Jimmy, at the end of the day, you know, everybody's not about winning championships. They're about making money. And that just goes to show when you look at what happened this year with the TCU team had a great season, outstanding record this year in the, the Big 12, you know, ran the table, completely flopped in the championship, lost to a good Kansas State team. But this when they got but, but, but when they got to the big stage, yeah. they were not close to being ready georgia battle tested when you run through the gauntlet of the sec unscathed undefeated that means a lot and so that is the reason why even a two loss alabama team or even a two loss tennessee i wouldn't give tennessee right. the straight the say the the same street cred as alabama in its system but a two loss alabama team is still in my opinion going to be stronger than a one loss tcu team Come i think we tennessee found that out. with two losses even though they lost to Georgia already in the season, probably would have gave Georgia a better, tougher game than yes. TCU. 
Yeah, they lost to Georgia. Now, I mean, the, the 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 blip on the radar was South Carolina. How they kind of got blown by South Carolina, who actually went on an upsurge at the end of the year. I don't know. However, I believe that there were a lot of folks who just didn't want to see Alabama in the Final Four again. And so they gave TCU the benefit of the doubt. And unfortunately, it didn't turn out very well for them. Um, it, it was embarrassing. It was humiliating. They were outclassed. Uh, they were out-talented. They were out-coached. Yeah, they and they, they, they just were not ready. But, Jimmy, I don't think too many teams would have been. But when you get to that stage, you should have enough of a team to not get beat 65-7. to seven. And, and that's a whole different ball of wax, Jimmy. 65-7. to seven. I, I don't think I've ever seen anything like that. Yeah, it's been a while since uh, I have to kind of go back to a few of those Alabama teams running scores up or the old Oklahoma team that used to run scores up. Um, and uh, maybe to some degree the Florida State team. But, Tom, let's, uh, let's move on. Yeah, exactly. And, again, the CFP is now going to be expanding from its top four team who are selected now to uh, a 12-team playoff starting in the 2024 season, Jimmy. And so that's going to be very interesting. Yeah, so I like the format, although I would have liked it a little better if they and maybe expanded to 16. Um, but the format of giving the top four a first-round bye uh, and then having the other eight kind of play like a wild-card round um, to get down to four and then do the brackets from 18 at that point uh, seems fair to me. I believe, Tom, that we could probably easily identify the top 10, 11 teams in America. That 12 team could be questionable between 12, 13, 14. You know, there may be some arguments to be made either way for a few teams, uh, whether they should be the 12th team or not, uh, based on their rankings or who they played, win-loss records, uh, strength of uh, their conference. Uh, but, Tom, let's be honest. The team 10, number, 10 11, and 12 – they get selected, uh, that's nothing but uh, 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 chopped beef to the pit bulls that are going to be in the top four. So whoever those last few teams are, I doubt ever, I, can, I think I'm safe to go on record, that none of them will ever be really playing for a national championship like a TCU. Um, in fact, TCU probably should have been one of those 10, 11, 12 teams um, you know, uh, or somewhere at the back of the pack as opposed to the front of the pack. So, but I think, you know, the top 10, probably easy. Yeah, I, I, I would maybe agree with you on that. three, maybe a little questionable, but it's not going to matter because whoever those last two teams are, yeah, you're not winning a national championship anyway. So it really doesn't matter which four or five teams we uh, they select, um, which two teams they select out of the last four or five to put in at number 11 and number 12. Well, if we look at what that would have looked like this year, Jimmy, you have the top, you have the, the conference championships who get an automatic bid in. Um, and so this year that would have been Georgia winning the SEC. That would have been Clemson winning the ACC. ACC. That would have been Michigan winning the Big 12. Uh, Kansas State winning the, I'm sorry, Michigan winning the Big 10, Big Kansas 10. State winning the Big 12. You would have had Utah winning the Pac-12, and then you would have had a Tulane uh, out in Louis in Louisiana winning the AAC. And those would have been your top six teams who won their conference championships. But the other next highest ranked teams, Jimmy, this year would have been Ohio State, Alabama, Tennessee, Penn State, University of Washington and Utah. That would have been your playoff this year if we had that. That would have been a better, better format, playoff format than uh, what we currently had this year, Tom. Yeah, yeah. It, it would have been interesting, Jim. I think it would have made a lot of money. And, of course, you know, at the end of the day, that's what they're looking at, how much money it is, and working out who's going to get what money and who's going to be getting a slice of the pie. And that's why it has unfortunately taken so long uh, for this to happen. Well, the, you know, I, I think the um, more money will be generated with a playoff system. And like I said, maybe one day expand out to 16 um, and incorporate the bowls into some of those playoff rounds. 
Uh, well, I don't know that you, you know, really buy yourself that much by expanding it to 16, uh, I guess maybe just to be nice and uh, get a couple more million dollars. But I think it, it, with with 12 teams for sure, you're going to find your best team regardless of who's trending at the end of the year. And then look at it for the, for the students, the fans. Your school may win, you know, two bowl games, three bowl games mm -hmm. uh, in the national championship. I mean, how exciting would that be? To go and win a couple, you know, go go in the uh, the wild court round, work your way out of there. I uh, have to win three games, to win a national championship, and all three of those uh, games are associated with some bowl. So that's some more money and more travel for the fans, and uh, more enjoyment, and excitement um, for the accomplishment of the uh, of the school. So right. I think it's a win win for everybody, Tom. Yeah, I, I would agree. And it just took them too long to uh, get to this point. But finally, Way too long. and uh, I think that everybody is going to be a heck of a lot happier for it because they'll be a part of the play, even if, even if their team has absolutely no chance of winning the championship, just being a part of the tournament. And I think that's really the hype when you talk about NCAA basketball. They start off with 64 and get it down to the Sweet 16, Elite Eight, Final Four. And it's just a lot of fun, a hell of a lot more fun sure. than the, the NCAA football format. So I, I think it it's going to work itself out. Now, talking a little bit, going up uh, one level to the pro football, Jimmy, you know, the uh, NFL season is now headed to the playoffs. Regular season is over. And you have a lot of folks talking about uh, what happened um, with the Houston, Texas organization who uh, are on their, I think, fourth coach in four years, Jimmy. And I think the general manager is currently hiring his third coach in three years. Uh, for those of you who do not know, uh, Lovey Smith, who was the former uh, coach of the Chicago Bears, had a stint with the University of Illinois and was hired by the Houston Texans last year um, as their head coach has been fired after one year, a 3-13 and season. And there are a lot of uh, questions, uh, more more importantly, fire coming at the Houston Texans. Their organization, Jimmy, has made a – doesn't make the NFL look very good. Well, Tom, that's the good old boy network in the NFL. Uh, if you're a black coach, you got to win right away. you got to have success right away. You got to be a Tom Thomason for the most part. Um, you got to deliver the goods because you don't get the chance to rebuild into a three, four, five-year plan to get into the playoffs. You know, to rebuild your team for the draft and some key free agency. You no, know, that, that that's not afforded to you. You better you better step into that that season and somehow put a winning record, a good product on the field right away to show that you got something to build on. Because if not you're not going to get the five-year plan, Tom. It just well, doesn't happen for black coaches. And, and, Jimmy, this is – but with what? If you look at the Houston Texans, what do they have to, to do in one year? The best player that they had on the team, of course, now is Robert the quarterback Stevens. for the Cleveland Browns. And prior to that, the best player on the team, J.J. Watt, mm -hmm. is with the Arizona right. Cardinals, who mm -hmm. just, fi who just fired – who just – Fired uh, Cliff Kingsbury after four years, only one winning season. So, I mean, there, there's a different set of rules, unfortunately, when it comes to black coaches. And so you had David Culley, who was hired for one year. He had nothing. He was fired. And then you have Lovey Smith, who was hired for one year. He had nothing. He was fired. But, Jimmy, if you look at the way that the Texans actually played this year, including – against the Dallas Cowboys, it's not that they weren't competitive. It's not that he didn't inspire his team. He had very little to work with in terms of talent to right. do anything in one year. And this is a statement about the ownership of the NFL. We always talk about the NFL, but let's be very clear. It's the ownership of the NFL that we're dealing with and the decisions that they're making because they can somehow find coaches – who have literally no head coaching experience in the NFL. Broadcasters. Exactly. Literally. Let's not talk about the Indianapolis coach, who, by the way, the Houston Texans just beat uh, this last game. And some suspect that because they did win, the Texans were in a position to get the number one draft pick uh, by being the worst team in the NFL. But the last time I remember, 
doing the math on this, Jimmy, a coach's job is to inspire his team to win, not lose. And right. so he loses the last game. Maybe that pissed off ownership because now they don't have the number one seed. So and one, two. It's <clears throat> not going to matter that much, really. You don't well, get a really good player at two. Uh, and if you trade that pick and go down, you could probably get some a couple of number ones for that number two pick. And still end up with uh, really, some really nice players to help you rebuild. Uh, but the pick is not the issue, Tom, not for me. The issue is, is that black coaches need to understand what they're stepping into. Understand when you're hired, you need to get a guaranteed contract for as many years as possible. So when you're fired, <clears throat> they're forced to uh, pay off your contract. Don't do a one-year, two-year deal. Most likely, you only have one year. I mean, really, if you don't, if you don't step into a situation, turn around, start winning right away. You're on a one-year contract. You know, but if you can negotiate a four or five-year deal, uh, guaranteed, um, that'll be your best bet. So at least after that one season, they can they'll have to pay you for you to leave. <clears throat> Unfortunately, Jimmy, that would be an ideal scenario. But because there are so few black head coaches in the NFL, I think maybe there were three, uh, four this year, maybe including uh, Lovey now gone. And you had, of course, an assistant head coach, or I guess they would say an interim. So he wasn't really the hired head coach. But you have Mike Tomlin, you know, with the Pittsburgh Steelers. You had um, – what is the brother's name at the uh, Tampa Bay Buccaneers? Hey, uh, they, they, um, they had, Mike is skating on thin ice. Who, who, you know, uh, well, he, he, yeah, Jimmy, I, I, I would say <clears throat> he lost Ben Roethlisberger. He has a young quarterback that may have some opportunity in the future, but given what he lost, his franchise quarterback, trying to find a quarterback, um, okay defense, but not – anywhere close to some of the more talented teams that the Pittsburgh Steelers have had. And he was able to still eke out a winning season. Jimmy, this is the no. second most tenured coach in the NFL behind Bill Belichick. He's never had a losing season. Never. He's probably, and he's only one losing season away from losing his job. That, that exactly. he's, he's on thin ice every year. Yeah. <clears throat> and so that bears in mind when we start talking about leverage, using our collective economy to make a difference. And unfortunately, that's not something that uh, the NFL has, has done, I think, an effective enough job as the, uh, the NFL Players Association. It is the only major sports team that doesn't have guaranteed gun track, uh, contracts, if my memory serves me correct. That's uh, base, true, Tom. Base, right. baseball. But coaches, uh, they, they can get a guaranteed contract uh, for the players, no. Uh, which is why you have to get as large a signing bonus as possible. A lot of times these contracts are backloaded. You get a $100 million contract, uh, 60 of it is on the last two years on the back end. And if you're not performing, um, maybe the first, you know, it's a five-year contract, you're thinking, oh, it's worth $20 million a year. No, it's worth, you know, $40 million each year for the last two years. And for the first three years, it's worth $20 million. So if you're not performing after three years, you know, they simply cut you, you know. So, uh, yeah, you got to get as much as you can up front and uh, get as much guaranteed money as you can, bonus money up front with the NFL. But, um, you know, there's a reason why they say it's not, it stands for not for long. But this is squarely on the owners, Jimmy. I mean, you're talking about a league that is, and I'm not even talking about coaches of color. I'm talking about black head coaches. Yes, the league, the, the, the league is 70% black. You show me any other sports organization, sports system, sports industry that is that far out of whack when it comes to the personnel have looked like for the last two generations and what the coaching. I mean, we're not just talking about coaching. We're talking about general managers, et cetera. I mean, it's 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 blatant, but nobody wants to call a spade a spade. When you look at most of the head coach, most of these head coaches, Jimmy, come from OC in the DC position, offensive coordinator, defensive right. coordinator position. You help me understand why Eric Bieniemy has never been hired, not once, for a coaching job, but teams will take 
folks who've never had any coaching experience in the NFL and make them a head coach. Eric Bieniemy, who is coached by far one of the most prolific offenses probably in the last generation. Not one head coaching job. Uh, you look at, I think we have three offensive coordinators, black offensive coordinators in the NFL, one being Eric Bieniemy. You got uh, Byron Leftwich, who is the offensive coordinator of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Uh, he's been in the league. You can't tell me, he, given the coaches that I have seen, and we can even talk about the NFC East coaches, you can't tell me that some of these coaches aren't as good, if not better. You got Pep Hamilton, who is the offensive coordinator of the Texans. We don't want to talk too much about that. They, 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 they may be equally good, and some may even be better. Better, but better. There's also, sure. there's also a little um, passive-aggressive uh, resistance here. You know, you also have this rule where I'm forced to interview black coaches. Um, I think at least one or two whenever I have a head opening spot. Really, I may not be interested in, 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 in a black coach at all. Of course, but, most of them. Well, Jimmy, that's obvious that they're not. It's okay. obvious they're not. And so being forced to interview the tokens, um, you know, probably may not sit very well with GMs and owners. Uh, so you have to kind of kind of face that sometimes when we put rules in place that we think are going to help, you know, really in the end, it may backfire. And like I said, when a black coach is given a chance, dude, you, you better be hitting seventh every role, every year. You better have a winning season, get into the playoffs, um, and stand competitive. Because the first time you put a losing uh, product on, on the field, you're gone. Well, you have a Houston, Texas organization that's been losing a long time. And you try to tell me you give them one year? One year, yeah. Tom. One year yeah, after. There's no three. four or five year plan. Uh, now, I guarantee you, the next coach they bring in, that coach is going to get a four year plan. Um, with draft picks, free agency, um, you'll, you'll get some breathing room to put a good uh, product on the field. You're not going to be a one and done. Trust me. And they probably won't be black either, Jimmy. Yeah, oh, and I can guarantee that uh, you won't get back to back black coaches, Tom. That's not going to happen. Yeah. And so, again, that comes down to leverage. And you have billionaires who run this league. We understand that. But to them, it all it, it, it comes down to money. It, it, it comes down to money. Un unless you were talking about at strategy and action that's going to impact their bottom line, you're not having a conversation that's relevant to them. Because I can say even for the owner of the Dallas Cowboys, who I will leave nameless, he's not in the championship winning business. He is in the money making business. Have no issue with him, but let's be transparent about it. Let's not talk about winning Super Bowls and you don't do the things that it takes to win Super Bowls because it's never been an issue of having Super Bowl talent, but you don't make the decisions from a coaching standpoint not a personnel standpoint, but from a coaching standpoint, that's going to produce Super Bowls. Well, it, hasn't a, it, hasn't, it hasn't happened. It hasn't happened in twenty five years. Uh, you have to be, be able to evaluate talent, especially in the draft. Um, you have to be very selective about uh, free agency that you don't overpay for players. You have to manage a cap. Um, so all these things become important. You know, when you're talking about a, a coaching position, then you have to give the coach time uh, to, uh, to, to to build this, to have a vision. Um, to see how it's going to work out. You know, teams that do that have a little bit more success than the teams that sort of, you know, always hire new coaches, new GMs. Every time you look up this new quarterback, new coordinators, um, there's all this turnover. You can't establish any kind of roots with that kind of turnover. So you have to be willing to give a coach, I'm thinking at least minimum three years. You should know after three years whether this is working or not. Or you see progress or not. Now, if there's no progress, then, hey, I understand. I'll cut you loose. We're going to start over with somebody else. But it can be a one and done. One year is just not enough time. Well, I understand one year is not enough time. But, I mean, how many years were you going to give Jason Garrett to win a Super Bowl? Jason, I think, got 10 years with the Cowboys, didn't he, or nine? It was somewhere close to that. I want to say it was maybe at least – I know it was at least eight years, Jimmy. But, I mean, I, 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 he, he was never – that type of coach, Jimmy. And how long 
how he was coaching for the Cowboys. Yeah, and Tommy, he's, and, and Tim, okay, and he's also his wife is the uh, grand niece of the owner. So having the family connection probably helped a little bit. I understand that, but that's the, that doesn't win championships, Jim. It does not, Tom. <clears throat> they gave Jason Garrett every chance to <clears throat> turn this around here in Dallas. Uh, he, he basically just wasn't a person. <laughs> and, and in my opinion, neither is, neither is Mike McCarthy. I mean, I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure he's a good guy, but neither is Mike McCarthy. Well, you know what? If they don't win Monday night, he may be bounced out too because um, he's had now a couple of years to show what he can do. And you put together some winning seasons, but you know, it's not here in Dallas. It's not just about winning seasons, winning divisions. It's about going to the conference championship. It's about going to super, winning Super Bowl. That's what the folks in Dallas here are star for. Um, everything short of that, getting to a playoff, winning a playoff game, hosting a playoff game, uh, even win a conference championship. Uh, yeah, we're not TCU. You know, we we, we want to win the whole thing, and that's short of that um, will get you fired. So uh, if Mike doesn't win Monday night, if the Cowboys go out there and lay an egg and stink it up, um, I'm pretty sure Tuesday he'll be packing his bag. Well, it'll be interesting to see. It's an owner GM issue, uh, and I think that unfortunately this organization and its track record, not in the regular season, but in the playoffs over the last quarter of a century is a reflection of not the coach, but the person who hired the coach. Sure. So, Tom, we're going to take this opportunity for uh, do a shameful plug for my okay. um, for my new company. Um, okay. You know, you know, last year I decided to start uh, a fashion company. Uh, we make polo shirts. So I, I love polo shirts. So um, generally I buy Ashworth or Ben Hogan's, um, you know, because I like the quality. And so this is one of the prototypes. Uh, I'm not the best model for because I'm a fat body. Um, but I have lost enough weight to finally get into one of my shirts. So, <laughs> well, you, know, you laugh, but, you know, hey, I used to wear a 4X. And I decided that uh, that was just way too big of being – that would be an irresponsible for a man to get that large. Um, so 2X is the largest we're ever going to go for men's shirts um, with this company. So it took me a little while to get down, to lose enough weight to get to a 2X. And I still, you know, as you can see, I'm not the best model for it. Um, um, but I do want to say that uh, we are gearing up production for, uh, for the spring and summer. And uh, for the fall next year, we'll have a hoodie line. So uh, b b between um, our signature uh, uh, polo shirts, our hoodies, our socks. So we'll be putting the uh, URL link. It it's really remclothingcompany.com. But we'll start posting the link out here uh, probably next month or so as we uh, gear up the e-commerce sites and get prepared to start taking orders. So shameful plug, but yeah. Uh, and then also... The uh, proceeds from uh, the sale of the shirts and the material uh, go to two things. Uh, one, to a nonprofit called ACH, um, Affordable Community Housing, that provides uh, housing for uh, low-income people and disabled veterans. And then the second um, path would be to fund educational opportunities for inner-city schools. So we want to uh, turn this around. Um, our plan is to see if we can somehow raise enough money to hire Dr. King, and then it'll be our uh, black education czar um, to help put programs together um, to show school boards around the country how to educate young black people the part of the right way. Gotcha. So, gotcha. So please support me in, our, in this effort. All right. That'll work, folks. And uh, we thank you so for your support on that. So, you know, last week we kind of rounded out. Uh, our first show, we're talking about some issues. There were some things that happened towards the end of last year in 2022. And now we are beginning to uh, focus and turn the corner into 2023. Look at what's going on in the world, what's impacting our community. Jimmy, we talked briefly, uh, I think, about the um, African summit uh, that uh, the Biden administration held a few weeks ago before the end of the year and some uh, interesting themes on that, Jimmy. And then maybe we can talk a little bit about what we see going on in the economy and in the world in 2023 that we need to focus on because we are a show that focuses on national and international issues. Here's the thing, Tom. 
I, I do not believe the Biden administration is going to fund initiatives in Africa to the tune of $55 billion. Um, I just don't think they're going to do it. Um, now when you just cut $30 billion from HBCUs, I, I don't see that administration having no interest whatsoever in advancing um, the cause of Black people in America and even less advancing Black people in Africa. I mean, just my, if, if they do, I'd be totally shocked and surprised. With that being said, <clears throat> since you made the commitment, since you've made the pledges, we should be fighting to hold this administration um, to their pledges. And you so know? the question then becomes, Jimmy, how do we, at the grassroots level, hold the administration accountable for the verbal commitment that they made right. to those, I believe it was, was it 49 African leaders who were- 49, uh, yeah, African leaders, um, even though it's 52. 40, 40, 49, 49 out of 54. Uh, 52, yeah, 54, 52. Yeah, 54, 54. Okay, um, so yes, yeah, so the, uh, we need to make sure the Congressional Black Caucus, I call it sellout caucus, they need to be holding the Biden administration feet to the fire. Next time the appropriation bills come up, um, which I know they've already did the continued resolution for 2023, but when you start talking about 2024, they need to be holding out that we're not going to vote for any appropriation bill. Um, we're going to collectively vote against every bill that comes out unless there's money in there uh, to restore the money for the HBCUs and money for the uh, pledges that you made to Africa. Uh, with how that being you, said, Tom, but, but, but how do you hold, how, literally, what do you need to do? How do you hold them accountable through your um, conversation? Either, either we don't vote for them or, or we primary them. But we just, but we just had elections, Jimmy. So how do you hold, now? Now that people are uh, butts in seats, you now have a Speaker of the House. Obviously, legislate the legislators are in session. We're not talking about voting anybody in or out for another two years. So right, what Tom, do you do now? It's it's very tight. I mean, the the Republican majority in the House, <coughs> what five votes? And you talking about the Congressional Black uh, Caucus with about fifty members? Tom, fifty votes in the House. When it's close like that, who can afford to lose 50 votes on anything you're trying to do? And, and, and the point is, is that you're not asking for anything unreasonable. You're not being like some uh, some of these uh, extreme Republicans who are asking for everything under the sun um, over the speakership. No, you're saying put the money back that, that was already committed and promised to the HBCUs. Put the money in there that you've already pledged to the African nation. That shouldn't be asking too much. And if if you don't do that, every bill, every bill that comes up, Tom, is gonna come fifty gonna be fifty votes short. And nobody has fifty votes to make up. And I guarantee you the nation could come to a stop if the uh, Congressional Black Caucus collectively use their weight and push it around. We saw what a few people can do when, when things are tight. Uh, Republicans can't overcome fifty votes. Democrats can't overcome 50 votes. So the Congressional uh, Black Caucus, they hold, they really, they hold the, the power if they can pull it all together in time, stay together as a caucus, and just say, here's what we want, and we're going to say no to everything until we get it. How do you hold their feet to the fire to make sure they do that? Tom, if they don't do it, we know who not to vote for our next election. We need to start uh, primary and getting other people to run against them if they're not going to support uh, black causes. I mean, you know, we, we're voting you in office to represent us to, in our interests. So if you go there, and I'm, I'm not saying that you're against everything else. I mean, I'm pretty sure there's some bridges, some libraries, some roads, some other stuff that... Um, that you may be interested in getting passed, okay, fine. But on the big stuff, we're going to hold everything up until this country do the right thing. Tom, we used to be about doing the right thing. We're the people who protest, put our bodies on the line against dogs, against water counts, against rubber bullets, against real bullets, against lynching, against throwing, being thrown in jail in order to fight to make this country live up to a world that all men have created equal. 
So we need to have that same spirit now, Tom. I'm not asking the Biden administration to give Africa anything that you haven't already promised them. If you if you didn't mean it, you should have said. You know, in, in the money that, that that Trump gave to the HBCUs, you had no reason to cut that out. That 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 you've increased spending by seven trillion dollars in two years. Everything got a, a pay increase, but but yet you find the need to cut the budget for the HBCUs. So put that money back because you had no reason to cut it. Honor your word that you gave the African nation because you're the one who made the promise. And Tom, those two things can't be too much to ask for. And, and if our black leadership can't deliver on those two things, then what's the point? What's the point of even having a black caucus, congressional uh, caucus, if y'all can't come together and support a black issue? And it's not like we're asking you to fix the black schools, which you should be fighting for that also, because uh, the black inner city schools are terrible. Y'all should collectively go out and hire uh, Mr. King and make him the black education czar and put him in charge of all of the um, uh, programs in these inner city schools on how to educate black boys. I, I trust him with a proven track record more than I, uh, I trust the Latino Chicago school board to, uh, to do the job. Gotcha. <clears throat> so we want to thank everybody who has joined our call thus far. Um, we have a couple of comments from my uh, brother Asar. Uh, keep a public scorecard on their vote. You're talking about the Congressional Black Caucus and uh, making sure that uh, we hold their feet to the fire and hold them accountable for the commitments that are going to directly impact our community. And um, also he mentioned the $55 billion, which is going towards building AFRICOM in uh, Africa which is the United States Africa Command, which uh, is an investment in security infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera in Africa. But at the end of the day, uh, Jimmy, we talk about holding their feet to the fire. But if you're going to do that, you have to have at least a short list of priorities and demands, as opposed to just- The short list of priorities it's, and demands is uh, that 55 billion, half of it needs to go to minority companies here in uh, America to black owned companies here in America, you need to sub that work out to it. Uh, we gotta find a way to recirculate those dollars. Let's say that somehow we fight and put pressure on the administration, they come through with the funding, which I doubt they're gonna do. But let's say they do. Mm -hmm. if, if the 55 billion is not coming back to black owned companies here in America, then what's the point? Okay, we wanna rebuild Africa, but we also wanna rebuild black America too. So we gotta find a way to do what the Jews do when they um, when they lobby for funding for Israel, and then Israel turns around and spend a lot of that money with uh, with uh, Jewish companies here in America, we find a way to circulate it. Tom, we got to find a way to tap in to the fifty five billion, even if it's not fifty five billion. Yeah, if it's just five billion, uh, some of that money needs to be earmarked and committed to going to black home companies here in America, and we got that allow us to have maybe the funding to start supplying the goods and services that Africa needs in order to grow. Well, Jimmy, I would have to agree with you on that. I mean, ultimately, if we answer the questions as to the what and why on the money and what is it going to be using for, there, there really is no, was no earmark there. What we do know is that when European Western interests or even Eastern interests start looking at the African continent, it's really either one, finding land to provide support for their countries and or their people right. or literally move their people there. Because let's be very clear. China has what? 1.6 billion people. Yes. Um, Africa, the continent has a collective of about 1.4 billion people. But when you look at the natural resources on yeah, the African right. continent compared to practically any other land mass in the world, any other continent in the world, when you look at the sheer land available for repopulating people, then you start doing the math on that and you look at what the agenda is. The Chinese are not going to be building roadways, bullet trains, infrastructure just for the benefit of Africans. No, Tom, they're not. Let's not, let's, let's, let's not be naive about this. So their and, investment in Africa has always come with strings attached. Of course, of course. And so what has to happen when you look at the 54 heads of state in the continent of Africa, we can't continue to do what you've been doing and expect to get a better result. 
because ultimately when you look at the beginning of the decolonization of the African countries in the 50s, Ethiopia being the only country that was not colonized by, by one of the European countries, uh, one of the, the so-called uh, Western powers, I mean, there were a small group in Krumah, um, a small group of leaders who were advocating for a unified Africa. Yes. Unfortunately, they got outflanked by the Western powers who influenced other African leaders to take it slow. Kind of like what, unfortunately, we did in America. Let's, let's, let's wait and see what happens. I think there are still five or six nations that are still carrying on the fight of trying to get a unified Africa. Um, but you're right, they got outflanked and, and it's unfortunate because um, they could have been a lot stronger collectively together. Jimmy, consider, c c consider this, Jimmy. When you look at the sheer mineral wealth on the African continent, when you look at the human capital on the African continent, when you look at the vast array of resources that you, we, we've talked about this before, a lack of infrastructure for energy and power and lighting, right. But when you look at the, the possibility of hydro, um, hydropower on the African continent, they have the largest, some of the largest masses of, of rivers yes. in, in, in the world. I mean, when you look at the potential for solar energy on the African continent, potential of possible nuclear energy, there is no other place where you need to go to Tom, get the, the, climate change folks, the climate change folks are not going to let Africa build power plants. Right. They, 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 they pay the African nations not to build power plants, especially coal, natural gas, um, nuclear is out of the question. Um, and so that's where they are. And so now the money is spent buying guns and weapons and ammo as opposed to developing a nation. And that is by design. That's how the Western powers want it. Um, because without energy time, without the power, you can't grow, you can't develop into a first rate country with no power. Correct. You can't do you can't run the factory off candles. Correct. You know, um, you know so that's where the African, and it's a shame if you go out to the NASA uh, website and look at the live fee from, well, it's slight delay, but look at the fee from the uh, International Space Station. As it passes over Africa, how dark Africa is. There are like a few lights here and there represent cities that have uh, the ability to power themselves at night compared to when you go over America or the Americas, because Central and South America has uh, a lot more cities lit up, uh, Western Europe and Asia, um, you know, but then when you get to Africa, it's like a speck here and a speck there. So it's a shame, Tom, that they're so strapped for cash, which is why and the African nations cannot afford to be doing business with, them with people who don't have their best interests. Black people here in America don't want to keep you behind. We want you to grow. We want to build those power plants for you. We want to supply the generators and all the equipment you need to grow. All we're asking is, can we work together? Can, can, we, can we go out and lobby for aid for you? And then you turn around and spend that money with us so we can both benefit. You know, don't don't take the money and go buy uh, AR-15 or AK-47 and a bunch of bullets uh, in order to protect yourself uh, from from some rebel group. You know, and, and your people are starving. Yeah, Jimmy. And so th there's going to have to literally be a a revolution of thought yeah. in terms of how our leaders in Africa are dealing with their their western colonizers because even though you don't literally have the french the dutch the germans um and all the other west including the united states directly controlling their boots on ground they are still colonizing them politically no, they're still, still colonizing, colonizing them economic they're colonizing them politically all those countries that simply come together and form what they call the un and the, and the international do. monetary fund and you're in, you're so indebted to the western nation uh, uh, that your only choice is either uh, you know, go to the UN or go to go to China. Uh, so those are your two options. Those are the lesser of two evils. You got to figure out which one uh, is going to do you in the, the quickest. Um, 
You know, so what we need is, like you said, a, a transformation of thought and find a way to bridge the gap. We need to take ownership of this, that we have to work together. And, and, the, and then the ahead. next question becomes, Jimmy, what is it that their brothers and sisters in the United States of America, what is it that their brothers and sisters in the Caribbean, what is it that their brothers and sisters in South America need to hatch in order to help support? Because at the end of the day, Israel, those who are considered to be Jews in the United States have a strong platform because the state of Israel has a strong platform. Right. Chinese have a strong platform in the United States because China has a strong platform. So goes the Koreans, so goes the Germans, et cetera, et cetera. The reason why Africans, the descendants of those who were brought here to build the economy of the United States, in essence, the world don't have a strong platform is because Africa does not have a strong platform. It, it, it has to do away with its dependent on Western powers. And if that means, just like if we paid attention to history, that the European countries who had nothing, literally nothing, went into a dark age, said, you know what? We're cutting out all of this foreign intervention. We're getting our act together. And when we come out of this, we will be unified. And this will not just be unification within the African continent but globally as well. Because if you look at certain groups that have power, it doesn't matter where they are, it doesn't matter where they go, they understand what their priorities are and they're all working collectively. Tom, um, you're absolutely correct. And we have to get away from thinking, this is why I don't like the hyphenate American thing. I don't like the African American, hyphenate American thing. We're black people. And, we, and black people exist around the world. And our blackness is what brings us, and bonds us together. Whether you're in the Caribbean, Central America, South America, whether you're in Africa, whether you're in uh, Europe or Asia, uh, hell, whether you're in, in, in Antarctica with the uh, uh, emperor penguins, it doesn't matter where you are, um, everybody on this planet is an African, but especially all of the black people on this planet are people of color uh, our blackness is what um, should bind us together. But we have to go back to the thinking of uh, Marcus Garvey, Tom. This has got to be an international effort. We got to get away from hair care and barbecue. We got to start thinking about ships, you know, uh, cargo ships uh, that we can stack up 10 stories high with those uh, shipping containers full of stuff from around the world that either we're manufacturing here and shipping or having manufacturing shipped to us. So, you know, when we start thinking globally, like you just said, you know, that makes more sense. Organizing that effort on a small scale, you know, to, to, to do something in South Dallas or just do something in Oak Cliff is way too small. I mean, it can be done time, and I'm not trying to uh, poo-poo on those efforts, but really we got to start thinking on a massive scale, trillion-dollar effort. We have $1.6 trillion here in America, which makes us what? about the eighth or ninth largest economy in the world. We got to start thinking like a $1.6 trillion people and stop thinking of ourselves being poor and broke and, and on our knees begging white people for freedom all the time. We got to get past that. We are real wealthy people. We can be even wealthier if we come together. Yes, Jimmy. And it's something that I won't say that I'm using the same language that the uh, the great Malcolm said is that, you know, the the, the brother in, in 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 Compton is in the same bad predicament as the brother in the Congo. The brother in Lagos is in the same bad predicament as the brother in Los Angeles. And so what we have to understand is this is an international struggle. Right. And regardless of where we are, we have to focus on the same priorities. We have to understand that our interests here are no different than our interests in Haiti, which we need to talk about very soon about what's going on in Haiti, because there are some very disturbing things going on there that we need to know uh, and understand. Our interests in South America, where we have one of the largest black populations in the world outside of the continent of Africa, their interests there are very similar and no different than our interests there, because the system that is exploiting our labor, the system that is exploiting our brilliance and our content is very similar. And so that's where we have to unify among common needs, among common 
goals, Jimmy. And I know we only have a couple of minutes left so we can right. uh, wrap this up, Jimmy. But that is the reason, ladies and gentlemen, why we are nationalizing and internationalizing our conversation for Black Men Speak. And that's for our sisters, too, who you we're know, here Tom, to uh, protect. Uh, last year, a little bit, and definitely the year before, you know, we had more of an international conversation. We talked about a lot of conditions that were on the ground in Mexico. And you're right. The, the hell that black folks are catching in Mexico is a lot of the same hell we're catching here in America. And now, Tom, I, I look at, and I was very shocked because I just thought um, the South Americans were just a little more past this. Uh, uh, black people in Brazil catching hell, Tom. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it's like, wait a minute. Yeah, I thought we got past all this color stuff and light skin, dark skin, and, 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 and black folks catching this type of discrimination in a country that you built. It's not like these are, are, are recent uh, uh, expats or immigrants to Brazil, Tom. These folks have been here for hundreds of years. Catching hell, Tom. So it, it just seems like no matter where you are in, a, in the world, black folks are catching hell around the world. So Malcolm was correct. So why not? If we're going to catch hell no matter where we are, why not come together globally, Tom? And I also want to, I think uh, Brother saw he uh, came up with a, uh, a another uh, fact. He said, not black, it's only a color. We are African peoples around the world. Until we accept and promulgate that fact, we will continue to languish under the oppression and exploitation. Because ultimately, at the end of the world, this is another uh, truism that Malcolm said a long time ago. Just because you, could, you put uh, kittens in an oven don't make them biscuits. All that being said is just because you take Africans out of the motherland and Brit and, and Brit put them in America and they build the greatest country in the world doesn't make them any less Africans. And just because you have Europeans who decide they're, Europe, they're going to go to Africa and exploit the land and the resources there doesn't make them all of a sudden Africans. Well, Tom, I say black rather than African for a reason. Uh, okay. Because I look at the African history and I see where foreign invaders have invaded Africa um, to the, such an extent, you know, when I, when I look at the genetic studies uh, that they do, and they try to go find the indigenous people. It's always amazing that the indigenous Egyptians um, or were dark-skinned people. The, the indigenous Africans were dark-skinned people. But yeah, when you look at the Middle East, uh, uh, the statues, even in Greece, uh, Mesopotamia, um, the we, we discover now that a lot of those statues, Tom, were painted brown. Yes. And a lot of people, the Greek gods, the, the, the Zeus, why is Zeus with brown paint and a wide nose? You know, these are, are pearl white statues now. Why are they painted brown as opposed to brain painted tan or white or some other color? You know, because these people were, were, were initially, the indigenous people were black. So Africa does not bond us. Our blackness bonds us. Well, Jimmy, I think that, 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 in principle, in principle, I would agree with you. But the point that that he's trying to make is there is no such place called black land. There is a place called Africa, even though obviously that was not the original name of uh, what we now call the African continent. But there is no such there is no white land. There is a France. There is a Germany. There is an India. Uh, there is a, you know, a. a, a Dutch. Well, I don't think we call it Dutch land, but it, we talk, we call it Africa, even though we understand that that name was given by a European. And that is, I think, the, the line of thinking that he was looking at. So we okay, can, but it we, is we, called we, we, Africa, we, Tom, but the indigenous people from most places around the world are black. Correct. So when you look correct. at the mitochondria, uh, uh, that DNA from the, the, the from female and the damaged Y chromosome we get from our fathers, um, when they trace all of those back, they all trace back to indigenous people and all the indigenous people, except for Neanderthals, the Peking, from other versions of, of, uh, of uh, uh, people were pretty much black. So Africa is not the only place that you found black people. There's every place in the, in the world well, you, you, part, you, that you have correct. homo sapiens, you have black people. You're correct. And but, every but place that, where there's not black people now, you see um, um, basically an influx of other DNA from other people like the Neanderthals um, that became popular. And, and those were the invaders, Tom. They invaded those lands and, and were able to conquer and hold on. But for the most part, black people have conquered the world and populated. So I don't limit us to just Africa. 
the world is ours. The, I mean, we're just black people and we're the people of this world, period. Uh, okay, and, and, and what I will, where I will agree with you is I think the context that you pick it, because obviously we understand that uh, the origin of the world and for tens of thousands yeah. of the years, for those who are completely honest, and even if though even if they go back to their historians, Lewis Leakey and the other ones, they yeah. understand who the original people were for tens of thousands of years before there was a change in the color and the texture yeah. and everything else. So that I understand your context. And with that being said, Jimmy, it is literally the top yeah, of the yeah, hour. Top of the hour. Tom, Tom, uh, the, the time goes by so quickly on our show, man. Um, so anyway, I hope everybody uh, had a, a, a good experience and. Hopefully, we talked about some good things that promote thought among our people. Oh, you know, we do, we do, and we do that every week, Jimmy. Yeah. So, and uh, we're all about uh, us coming together, finding solutions that uh, we can work together. Uh, one last thing, Tom, and then we can close the show out. Um, I was uh, talking to a Jewish fellow who um, made the comment that when one Jewish person makes a dollar, that five others make a dollar also. Uh, they do as a group. And he said, uh, to be totally honest, if I can speak frankly, uh, it seemed like your people are all about, uh, about, about doing it themselves. And, you know, they, rather than make a dollar and help five others make a dollar, uh, black people want to make the $6 themselves. So we, we need to get together and find a way to start working together, Tom, so we can all make money and grow uh, and get up out of this hole. And it's not about just one of us or two of us escaping. Um, so it's about all of us into the promised land. I would agree with you, Jimmy. And with that being said, ladies and gentlemen, we want to thank everyone for tuning in tonight. We want to thank everyone for uh, supporting our show. If you have not, uh, please do like, please do um, share this information. Subscribe, yes. And share this information with other folks. We will be back next Wednesday, Jimmy, because we know that if it is Wednesday night. It's Black Man Speak. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. All right.